Good afternoon, everyone. Please remain standing for a moment as University Chaplain Janelle Davis leads us in the invocation. First, I'm glad to see you when it's not raining. Thanks to all of you who did go downtown. Congratulations, new physicians. Congratulations, new PhDs. You have reached for your dreams. You have worked hard to achieve goals to become healthcare researchers and practitioners. You have sacrificed, you have met challenges, you have faced obstacles, you have been sleep deprived, yet you have stayed a course that required personal stamina, consistent determination, and remarkable moral courage. We give thanks for the quality of care and for the honest hope that you will provide to those who will rely on your skills, seek your good counsel, count on the soundness of your judgment, and trust your professional integrity. Respect the dignity of your patients. Be humbled by the respect and high esteem that your patients and their families will assign to you. Be wise and humane. Be just and generous. Be compassionate. Preserve your good spirit. Hold as sacred lifelong learning and protect your open heart. May it be so. May it be so. Amen. Please be seated. It's really my privilege to welcome the MD and PhD graduates of the class of 2K10 to today's ceremonies. And I also want to thank all the family and friends who are here. What I'd like to do is to have all the students stand up, turn around, find someone here who helped you get here, and thank them by clapping for them. Thank you to everyone's family and friends for being here today and for sharing this very special time. Uh, as you heard from Chaplain Davis, I also want to hope that everyone is dried out from this morning's event. You will be, I think, pleased to hear that until about two years ago, this event was also outside. And uh, fortunately, we've moved inside. Uh, this is a, a track and field venue. I like to think of this as exemplifying the fact that a career in medicine is not a sprint, it's a very nice marathon, and today is really the beginning of that. And as part of that, I usually use this time to give my brief remarks, sort of the history of medicine as applied to where you are now in your career. But first, you may not be surprised that President Bollinger, who could not deliver his address downtown, asked me to read it in its entirety. I said no. <laughs> so you'll only get my rather brief address. I like to use this as a time to talk about what I'll call the uh, abridged version of the history of medicine. Downtown, the students with me recite the Hippocratic Oath. We'll do it again here. And if you ask someone what's in the Hippocratic Oath, they usually don't know but they remember sort of vaguely this one basic concept, which is do no harm. And in many ways, medicine began with that fundamental principle, do no harm. What's amazing is for how long medicine mostly did harm. And it wasn't intentional. It wasn't because doctors didn't mean well. It was not because they didn't care or try to care. It was because they just didn't know any better. And it's sort of hard to believe that a profession whose abiding principle was do no harm relied on such treatments as bloodletting, purging, leeches. Actually, leeches have come back a little bit. But those sorts of treatments are just hard to believe. 
there's still debate about whether George Washington really died from his pharyngeal infection or because they took so much blood from him. So for much of our history, that's what doctors did. In my career, I've been a proponent of what's called hospitalists. Students know what I mean, the medical students, because hospitalists are now doctors who help take care of sick patients while they're in the hospital. And they have a special training, a special role in doing so. And when we first started this career pathway of hospitalists, people called the field hospitalism. Kind of made sense. And then someone wrote me a note saying, do you really know what hospitalism means? Turns out that the term hospitalist is new. The term hospitalism has been around for centuries. It referred to all the bad things that happened when you went to a hospital. And it's hard to remember, but for much of humankind, hospitals, the extent to which they existed, were almshouses for people who were too poor to be cared at home. It wasn't that the hospitals had anything special to offer. It's just that if you're too poor to be cared for in the relative safety and isolation of your home, where you could only get infections from those who happened to be in your home, you'd go to a hospital where you could catch things from lots of other people. And so hospitalism really meant all the bad things that happened in hospitals. Medicine re really began to change in Germany in the mid to late 19th century. With a movement called in the German, I'm not very good at German, so you'll forgive me, Inernen Medizin, loosely translated now into internal medicine. And that's not to say that internal medicine is the only specialty that focuses on scientific medicine, which is really what Inernen Medizin meant. It's that that was when medicine began fundamentally to change for a profession that tried to see what someone was complaining about and give them something that would treat that to a profession would try to understand the fundamental underlying causes of disease. After World War II in the United States, we see the rise of health insurance for hospitalization. Now hospitals actually can do things that can be beneficial. And during the wage and price freezes of the post-World War II era, providing fringe benefits was a way to compete for skilled workers. And one of the major fringe benefits was health insurance, which would provide for coverage when people went to the hospital. Because now, even people who could be afford to be cared for at home would go to the hospital for things that couldn't be done at home. After World War II, we also see the rise of the NIH and fundamental biomedicine being supported here in this country. We see epidemiology coming of age with the Framing, Framing, Framingham Heart Study, which identified the causes of heart disease including something we'll talk more about later, which is cholesterol. And ultimately, randomized trials bring evidence and create evidence-based medicine. And to give you a sense of how important that is, I think back to when I was early in my training and just about to belong to the faculty for the first time. And there's a proposal to do a randomized trial of medications that suppress irregular heartbeats arrhythmias, which some of you learned how to spell yesterday. And since we knew that arrhythmias were associated with death, and we knew that these medications suppressed the arrhythmias, it was obviously logical that the medications that suppressed the arrhythmias would prevent death. And these medications were used widely, one might even say indiscriminately. When the concept came to do a randomized trial to prove this logical progression, many doctors thought it was patently unethical. How could you possibly have patients in a control group? How could you possibly test something that was so logical, seemed to be so true? Well, ultimately, the study was done. Not surprisingly, it was stopped before the projected number of enrollees because one group did far better than the other. What's amazing is that the group that did better was the group that got placebo. The group that received the medication that seemed effectively to suppress the arrhythmias was more likely to die. The logical progression of thought was not truly evidence. 
you're going to be entering the medical profession as practitioners, as researchers, as PhD scientists, in an era when we really care about the evidence, when we really care about knowing what's right, and when we believe that medicine is this combination of caring, which has existed for many centuries, and real science, which is a relatively new development that allows that caring to be expressed in ways that are far more beneficial to the patients who count us for their care. It's to this wonderful profession that you'll become a member, and this profession and your accomplishments that we celebrate today. Before I go to the faculty awards, I'd like to thank the faculty and administrative staff who are here on the stage with me for their leadership throughout the year and for their role in your education. I also want to explicitly acknowledge one of our Columbia University trustees, uh, Dr. Kenneth Ford, who's going to assist me uh, with a presentation of the faculty awards. Dr. Ford. Uh, Dr. Ford is a chair of the Health Sciences Trustees, the university subcommittee uh, responsible for trying to keep me in line. Yesterday, as you know, we had the student awards. Today is the time for the faculty award. The Distinguished Service Awards are the highest awards we give and recognize individuals who have served the College of Physicians and Surgeons with the greatest dis distinction, bringing honor to the institution, to its alumni, and to the profession itself. Today's honorees are Catherine Kalame and Andrew France. Catherine? Dr. Kalame, Professor Emerita of Microbiology and Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics, has had a distinguished career in which she has made major contributions in multiple areas of molecular immunology. Her work has shed light on gene regulation and lymphocyte development in the immune system. She's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences of the Institute of Medicine. She served on advisory boards for the NIH and for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She's an excellent teacher who was instrumental in organizing the school's main immunology course. I also want to acknowledge Dr. France, who's unable to be with us today. Dr. France is a professor of medicine, associate dean for admissions at PNS, and he's the person who had the good judgment to admit all of you to the medical school. He served as our Dean of Admissions since 1981, but before that, and even during some of his time as Dean of Admissions, his laboratory was the first to show that human prolactin exists in human pituitaries and circulates in the blood as a hormone distinct from human growth hormone. Later, his laboratory was the first to develop the bioassay by which prolactin could be measured in serum as normal physiology and abnormal physiology in pituitary tumors, for example, uh, could be explored. Dr. Kalane and Dr. France, who can't be with us here today, please accept our appreciation of these awards for distinguished service to the College of Physicians and Surgeons. <laughs> Next are the Ch Charles W. Baumfalk Awards, established for the generosity of John Frederick and House Baumfalk a member of a graduate of the PNS class of 1884, not 1984, 1884. These awards recognize distinguished teaching in the preclinical and clinical years. This year's Baumfalk Award for preclinical teaching goes to Dr. Jonathan Barash. Jonathan? Jonathan is an associate professor of medicine and anatomy and cell biology. He completed his MD, PhD, and residencies here. Mm -hmm. We should get you a car. No. <laughs> As a, he teaches students in all four years and has consistently received fantastic reviews for his skills. Just a sample of comments from one student. I really appreciate the opportunity to learn how to start approaching problem solving from the perspective of such a brilliant doctor. Another simply said, Dr. Barash equals greatest person ever. <laughs> This year is asked to lead the transformation of the basic science portion of the entire first semester of the first year, which resulted in a new integrated course called Molecular Mechanisms. His emphasis that students learn to formulate questions and hypotheses 
and discuss original literature to show the students how scientists come to conclusions and how facts are defined. It's a pleasure to award Dr. Barash with the Baum Falk Award for Distinguished Teaching. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks. 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 Thanks, Dr. Thank Ford. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Baum Falk Award for Clinical Teaching is awarded to Dr. Katherine Nickerson. Dr. Nickerson is a professor of clinical medicine and currently directs the third year clerkship in internal medicine. She's a graduate of the University of California, San Francisco, and has been here at PNS since 1984. Through her work on Columbia's teaching partnership with Bassett Healthcare in upstate New York, she's been instrumental in helping us launch a new model of medical training designed to address the nation's severe shortage of rural physicians. She also receives just spectacular reviews for her teaching skills. Quotes such as, Dr. Nickerson consistently runs the most viable hours of my week. And she's able to teach at a skill level that was appropriate for medical students and for residents. In fact, in 2001, Dr. Nickerson actually received the same award for the preclinical year, so you're now done like the double. It's our pleasure to honor Dr. Nickerson with the Baum Falk Award for Distinguished Teaching. Kathy. Thanks. Thank you. The Leonard Tao Humanism and Medicine Award from the Arnold Gold Foundation is presented each year to a student and also to a faculty physician who's demonstrated compassionate and devoted patient care and who is a humanistic role model for students and young physicians. This year's awardee is Dr. Leslie Simpson. The Humanism Award was renamed in 2003 to honor Leonard Tao, a person who's lived his life with great compassion and respect for others, who's a real personal friend of mine and of the university, and whose name is really associated with the integrity and caring that serve as the core mission of the Gold Foundation. Dr. Simpson is an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology, chief of obstetrics in the division of chief for maternal and fetal medicine, and medical director of the Center for Prenatal Pediatrics. She's an outstanding clinician and ultrasonologist who sees mothers with high-risk pregnancies, some of whom may develop life-threatening situations with little warning. She delivers patient care with compassion and sensitivity while balancing professionalism, humanism, and her medical practice. She has the ability to bring hope to uncertain and stressful situations while still being realistic about the outcomes. She's a dedicated teacher and mentor, as described by our fellows as a brilliant clinician, dedicated advocate, and beloved selfless teacher. Dr. Simpson, for exemplifying the standards of the Leonard Tal Humanism and Medicine Award, it's our pleasure to recognize you here today. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. The Harold and Golden Lamport Research Awards were initiated in 1983 to honor outstanding young researchers in the basic and clinical sciences. This year's Dr. Harold and Golden Lamport Research Award in Basic Sciences goes to Dr. Fiona Deutsch. Dr. Deutsch. Congratulations. Dr. Deutsch was recruited to PNS in 2003 as an assistant professor in pathology and cell biology, neuroscience, and neurology as part of our stem cell initiative. Her interdepartmental research uses a variety of molecular, cellular, and genetic approaches to discover the regulation, lineage relationships, diversity, and function of stem cells and neuronal production in the adult mammalian brain. Her study of the biology of neural stem cells and their in vivo niche is key to understanding brain repair and neural pathologies, including tumors, and will also certainly lead to other insights in stem cell fields. Dr. Deutsch, it's an honor to present you with the Dr. Harold and Golden Lamport Research Award in Basic Science. Congratulations. The Dr. Howard and Golden Lamport Research Award in Clinical Sciences 
This year goes to Dr. Anthony Ferrante. Tony? There you go. Dr. Ferrante is the Dorothy and Daniel Silberberg Assistant Professor of Medicine, and he studies the molecular mechanisms of insulin resistance and the effects of obesity on the cardiovascular system. His research in our Naomi Berry Diabetes Center has shown that large increases in fat mass lead to obesity and adversely alter blood pressure, insulin sensitivity, serum lipid profiles, and cardiac functions. His interest in the metabolic aspects of inflammation have led to findings that represent the very best in translational research, improving our understanding of molecular biology in both human and rodent systems. Dr. Ferrante, I'm delighted to present you with the Dar Dr. Harold and Golden Lamport Research Award in Clinical Sciences. Congratulations. Thank you. Class of 2010 uh, selects a Distinguished Teacher Award. Uh, you heard his uh, stirring presentation yesterday and certainly got a sense for why he's the winner of this award. Uh, by our tradition, this award will be uh, presented by this year's class president, John Casper. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's truly an honor to present this award to uh, a professor who gave us some of the most outstanding lectures in our first year in, in cardiovascular medicine and pulmonary medicine, and more importantly, took an interest in us not just as students or budding professionals, but as people. And he evidenced that every day when you walked by him or if you see him in the hospital, he says hi, and he's really interested in what you're doing and how you're doing. Uh, it's, it's really been a privilege to be at an institution with people like this. And uh, Mark Dickstein, Dr. Dickstein, you were a tremendous professor, and the class of 2010 is honored to give you this award. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the Nobel laureate, Dr. Michael Brown. Over the years, Dr. Brown, who shared the 1985 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine with his close friend, Joseph Goldstein, has spoken widely about the essential attributes of clinical research and the challenges of drug discovery. His story, though, is really, I think, remarkable. Uh, while in training, he and Dr. Goldstein were asked to see the two siblings, ages six and eight years old, who were dying of recurrent heart attacks. The cause was a gen genetically elevated level of the cholesterol-carrying low-density lipoprotein, LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol. The children were born with cholesterol levels over 1,000 and started having heart attacks before the age of five. They had a rare genetic abnormality called homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, which affects about one in a million children. And they were determined to find the cause of this defect, not only because of the rare child with this homozygous affliction, but also because the parents of these children, who were heterozygous, also had substantially elevated cholesterol levels that put them for great risk of heart attacks, not at age six or eight, but prematurely during adulthood. And together, in a remarkable example of the kind of teamwork that I will argue is now the way all of medicine is practiced, they discovered the LDL receptor in the liver that controls the level of cholesterol in the blood and in the cells. The students know this story well, but for the rest of you, Think of this sort of as a thermostat that's supposed to sense the temperature, in this case the LDL level, but doesn't and goes haywire and keeps on telling the liver to turn up the heat, in this case the cholesterol level. 
Their work led to the cloning of the receptor, the understanding of how it worked, and formed the fundamental basis for the statins, the drug that most of you are familiar with, which basically fools the receptor into thinking there's yet even more cholesterol. So even a defective thermostat will turn down the heat. Statins today are taken by more than 20 million people worldwide, and we can argue that probably even more should be taking them. Uh, Dr. Uh, Brown's research has uh, continued uh, at the molecular, cellular, and whole body level to study various other mechanisms underlying cholesterol metabolism. Dr. Brown was born right here in Brooklyn, later moved to Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, was educated at the University of Pennsylvania for versus both his BA and MD degrees, did his training at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and moved in 1971 to Dallas, Texas, at that time an outpost, but with his leadership and the leadership of others, became one of the extraordinary medical and medical research complexes in the U.S. He's, of course, a member of all the right societies, including the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, and the Royal Society of London. He, with Dr. Goldstein, won the Gairdner Award, the Harwitz Award, uh, the Lasker Prize, the U.S. National Medal of Science, and the Nobel Prize. It would be hard to find someone who better exemplifies a strong understanding of clinical medicine, trained as a real doctor, attended on the wards, uh, but also understands science and the translation of that science to improving humankind. It's really my pleasure to introduce a friend, a colleague, and a role model for all of us, Dr. Michael Brown. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, for that uh, really um, over-the-top introduction. Uh, I don't deserve it, frankly. Um, but um, I'm honored um, to be asked to give this address today. Um, and Dean Goldman, future physicians of the class of 2010, proud parents, relatives, friends of the graduates, members of the faculty, and all other voyeurs of this joyous occasion, congratulations to the class of 2010. Let me tell you that your, that your faculty and administration really cares about you. When I agreed to give this lecture, I received at least five or six letters and emails urging me to keep my remarks brief, less than 10 minutes. So they do care. <laughs> I promise that my speech will not be the longest in commencement history which was given at Harvard 200 years ago. It lasted six hours, the first three in Latin and the last three in Greek. But my speech will also not be the shortest, which was given by your distinguished fellow New Yorker, Woody Allen, who gave his advice in just three words, don't screw up. My topic today will be class, C-L-A-S-S. -S. Columbia graduates have class. All great physicians have class. What do I mean by class? Class has five letters. These letters stand for the five attributes that make a great doctor. For the rest of this lecture, I'll discuss these attributes one by one. C stands for compassion. This is the first requirement. By compassion, I don't mean ordinary compassion, simply feeling sorry for people. I mean medical compassion, which is much more challenging and demanding. Medical compassion is what you feel when you tell a young man that he has an inoperable brain tumor, or worse, when you tell a young couple that their child must undergo painful operations that may not even work. Such bad news must be conveyed by the physician in charge. 
It can't be left to nurses or social workers or office assistants. It can't be done by fax or email or even the telephone. You have to look the patients in the eye and convince them that you will do everything possible to help. They must feel your compassion, and it must be real. Medical compassion is what you need when you're a house officer, and you curl up for a few minutes of sleep on a cot in the emergency room at 3 a.m., and you're awakened 15 minutes later because there's a homeless man in the emergency room who is vomiting blood. He's filthy, smelly, unshaven, and intoxicated, and he doesn't want to be there. He struggles and curses you and everyone else, and you've got to impose yourself on this man and make him better, even though he doesn't want to be better. Medical compassion is not inborn. It must be learned, and I'll tell you when you learn it. You learn it the next morning, when the nurses and orderlies have cleaned up the patient, have wiped away his vomit and his blood, have bathed him and shaved him, and the intoxication is gone, and you find out that he is really a human being, a person, and that's when you're thankful for medical compassion. It gets you over the rough spots. Medical compassion is essential now because it sometimes conflicts with HMOs and their cost-benefit analysis, which says that it's cheaper to let a few people die of breast cancer than it is to pay for routine screening mammograms. It's cheaper to let a few die of heart attacks rather than to pay for cholesterol-lowering medicines. This is the same logic that the Ford Motor Company used when it calculated that it was cheaper to settle the occasional lawsuit Obviously, I've offended the Ford Motor Company. <laughs> Can you, ah, thank you, no. The Ford Motor Company used the same logic when they calculated that it was cheaper to the, settle the occasional lawsuit rather than to fix the, the exploding gas tank on the Ford Pinto. As a, as a physician, I cannot accept this logic. It conflicts with my compassion for the individual. Compassion creates tension between physicians and HMOs. Please don't lose your compassion, even when the HMO disagrees. I've spent a lot of time on compassion because it's the most essential attribute of the physician. Compassion is your American Express card. Don't leave home without it. Compassion is essential, but it's not sufficient. Without the other four attributes, compassion would be futile. What do the other four letters of class stand for? L stands for learning. To be a physician, you must know how the body functions when it is healthy and what goes wrong when it's diseased. At Columbia, you've started to acquire this knowledge. It began with gross anatomy. You pried into a human being with an intimacy that society allows only for physicians. You examined every muscle, artery, vein, nerve, and bone. You teased apart the kidneys, the heart, and the brain. You studied the cells that make up these organs, and you learned the biochemistry that powers the cells and you learned how genes orchestrate the whole process. You learned how the body fights back when it's attacked from the outside and how it decays when age hardens the inside. And you learned how physicians use drugs to forestall death. Many of you complained about all of this learning. The amount of knowledge is too great. How can any one person know more than a small piece of it? Although your generation has more to learn than my generation, you have one advantage that my generation lacked, the computer, the world's greatest library in your bedroom. This difference between generations reminds me of a story. 22 years ago, 
Joe Goldstein and I received the National Medal of Science from President Ronald Reagan at the White House. President Reagan told a story about the time he was governor of California in 1967 and an angry delegation of college students barged into his office. They were typical students of the 60s, long hair, beards, t-shirts, cut-off pants, sandals. They challenged his decisions about the University of California and their leader cried out, how can you possibly govern us? Our world is different than yours. When you grew up, you didn't have jet planes, television, computers, high-speed communications, you can't possibly understand us. Well, Mr. Reagan thought for a while, and then he said, you know, you're right. My generation was not born with jet planes, television, computers, or high-speed communications. We invented them. Well, just as the students of the 60s faced a new world, so do you face a new world of medicine. My century, the 20th century, was the extrinsic century. When the century began, the major killers were extrinsic invaders that caused pneumonia, tuberculosis, syphilis, diphtheria, cholera, scarlet fever. We conquered them all. Your century, the 21st century, will be the intrinsic century. The major killers of your time are intrinsic to the human body heart disease, cancer, dementia, and the aging process itself. My generation has presented your generation with a new weapon, the human genome sequence. Used properly, this sequence will help you conquer the intrinsic diseases whose ultimate causes lie not in our stars, but in our genes. In the 20th century, medicine was one size fits all. In the 21st century, medicine will be custom fitted to each person's genome. As physicians, you must be ready for this revolution. To be ready, you must continue to learn. Columbia has given you a head start, but you must maintain the momentum on your own. Keep learning. Let's return to class. To be a physician with class, you need compassion and learning. What does the A stand for? A stands for astuteness, which is wisdom or judgment. You can, you can be full of compassion and learning, but without astuteness, you won't know when to apply that learning. You can't learn astuteness from a computer. It comes only from observations. During your residency, pick out the smartest person you can find. It might be a, a fellow resident, or it might be a senior physician. Figure out why they're so smart. How do they always know the right thing to do? Test yourself by trying to anticipate their decisions. Why did they decide that this woman should have a radical mastectomy and another woman a lumpectomy? There is no right or wrong answer. You can't make medical decisions based only on statistics. Remember, doctors treat individual human beings. A decision that is right for one patient may be wrong for another. This is astuteness, and you learn it by imitation. Class has two S's. The first S stands for skill. Compassion, learning, and astuteness are useless without skills. You've already begun to learn those skills. You started by learning how to take a history and do a physical examination. You learned how to size up a patient with all of your sense organs, your eyes, your nose, your hands, and the physician's most important organ, your ears. You learn the three special skills of the medical student, finding, holding, and inventing. Finding a missing chart, a missing x-ray, a missing lab report, or a fresh pizza at 3 a.m. Holding a retractor steady for hours without falling into the incision. And inventing an answer on rounds and doing it so convincingly that the professor thinks you must be right. As residents, you will learn new skills. Learn them well. You must aim to be the best at everything you do, whether it's bypassing an artery, catching a baby, or pushing a colonoscope. You have to gain confidence in your skills so that you don't fear challenging tasks. In your heart of hearts, you must believe 
that you are better than anyone else at what you do. Now we come to the final S, the last of the five attributes, and the one that differentiates the physician from all other healers. The first four attributes are not unique to medicine. Compassion, learning, astuteness, and skill. Social workers have those attributes. So do ministers, rabbis, and priests. I even knew a compassionate lawyer once. <laughs> they heal in their own way. What makes a physician different? The answer is the final S, and it stands for science. I'm not talking about laboratory science. I'm talking about the philosophy of science. Very much that what Dean Goldman was saying a few minutes ago. The core beliefs that date back to Hippocrates. We have four fundamental beliefs. One, we believe that all diseases are produced by physical or chemical mechanisms that obey the laws of nature. Two, we believe that we can learn these mechanisms if we're smart enough. Three, we believe that mechanism-based treatments can prevent or cure disease. And four, we choose these treatments based on scientific evidence. The belief in rational mechanisms and the, and the demand for evidence to justify treatment are the two features that distinguish physicians from all other healers. To quote my great teacher in Dallas, Donald Selden, physicians are people who apply medical science to the relief of pain and suffering in individual human beings. No other element of society can do this. It is our unique role and our sacred obligation. Our science is not perfect. Often we must take actions that aren't fully justified by scientific evidence. And sometimes we must change our tactics as new science overthrows old dogmas. This constant updating is part of the scientific process itself. In science, all ideas are open to challenge. At Columbia, your education has been based in science. You are primed to practice in an analytic mode. I urge you to keep practicing this way for the rest of your life. Well, there you have it. C-L-A-S-S, -S, five letters that define a great physician. Compassion tells you that you must do something. Learning tells you what to do. Astuteness tells you when to do it. Skill tells you how to do it. And science tells you why you're doing it. Let me repeat those because it's really important. Compassion tells you that you must do something. Learning tells you what to do. Astuteness tells you when to do it. Science tells you how to do it. A skill tells you how to do it, and science tells you why you're doing it. Engrave these five letters in your mind and remember them as you heal your patients. Only then will you fulfill the hopes that Columbia has for each one of you. Go forth and make us proud, and don't screw up. Thank you. So just as the education of medical students is uh, bifurcated, most of the first two years, science, most of the second two years, clinical, the PhD students, first year and a half or so in the classroom, the rest of the time in the laboratory, so too is our graduation bifurcated. We are now finished with everything serious. And now it's just about the fun. I would thank Dr. Brown for being such an important part of the seriousness, and Dr. Ford and all of our award winners. And Dr. Melman, who's the Senior Associate Dean for Student Affairs, gets to lead the fun part. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, Dr. Robinson gets to lead the first part of the fun part. Uh, Richard Robinson, who is our 
uh, vice dean for graduate students will come up and join me to present the diplomas to the graduate students. <clears throat> I should begin by saying that since graduate students graduate at various times during the year when they finish their theses, there are lots of graduate students who aren't here today. We're delighted that so many of you were able to join us both downtown and uptown. Rich? Thank you. Congratulations to all of our MD and PhD graduates. We're going to start with uh, two dean awards for excellence in research and then go on to issuing of the diplomas. We have over 350 students at the medical campus working toward a PhD in biomedical science with about 10% of them being combined MD PhDs. Most of those students are engaged in basic research but often progress in that research requires technical and methodological advances. This year's two recipients of the Dean's Award for Excellence in Research illustrate this point. Both awardees developed new methods during their doctoral studies that are likely to greatly impact future research. But more than that, each went on to apply those methods to fundamental questions in their respective fields, generating important new basic science insights. I'd like to invite the recipients up to the podium now, please. They are Jesse Richardson-Jones from the Graduate Program in Pharmacology and Molecular Signaling, whose mentor was Dr. Renee Hen, and Samit Sarin from the Graduate Program in Genetics and Development, whose mentor was Dr. Oliver Hobart. Let me very briefly tell you about each of their research. Jessie defended her PhD with distinction last summer. Jessie's thesis research encompasses two exceptional conceptual advances for the scientific field. First, providing a causal mechanism to explain treatment response and resistance in clinical depression. And second, providing novel roles for two populations of serotonin 1A receptors in the brain. In addition to these conceptual advances, her work has also brought an exciting technical advance to the field of transgenic mouse research in the form <coughs> excuse me, of a novel system for gene suppression in the mouse brain. The novel findings Jessie has generated are due in large part to the elegant and specific manipulations she is able to achieve with this genetic system. Samit defended his PhD in December. His effort to positionally clone a gene using whole genome sequencing methods in C. elegans has begun to revolutionize the landscape of neurogenetics and in invertebrate model systems. This work resulted in a pair of papers in Nature Methods that are likely to be heavily cited in the research community. Using this methodology, Sumit went on to clone three neurodevelopmental mutants and in the course of doing so provided an intriguing example of multi genetic trait loci, one that would have been almost impossible to figure out by conventional genetics. Jesse and Sumit, it gives me great pleasure to present you with these awards. <laughs> Including the award recipients, we have 75 students who earned their PhD in the past year. As Dr. Goldman said, they finish at various times during the year, unlike the medical students who finish as a cohort, and so only some of them are able to return and be with us today. Um, I would now ask Assistant Dean Loaf to come up and join Dr. Goldman and I as we hand out the diplomas. I ask all, <coughs> all candidates for the PhD degree to please stand. <coughs> As I call your name, please step forward to receive your degree. Michael E. Bales, Biomedical Informatics. Sonia Tatiana Brossel, Genetics and Development. Jill S. Carmody, Nutritional and Metabolic Biology. <clears throat> Catherine Ann Fantazzo, Genetics and Development with Distinction. Dr. Fantazzo is also the recipient of the Samuel Rover and Lewis Rover Award 
for outstanding achievement in genetics and development. Yaiko Hayama, Nutritional and Metabolic Biology. Aliki Costelli, Nutritional and Metabolic Biology. Francis Joseph Martin, Pharmacology and Molecular Signaling with Distinction. Maggie O'Meara, Genetics and Development. Christopher Oliver Ortiz, Neurobiology and Behavior. It's not. Neil Aaron Paragas, Nutritional and Metabolic Biology with Distinction. Alyssa Marie Piccini, Pharmacology and Molecular Signaling with Distinction. Jesse W. Richardson Jones, Pharmacology and Molecular Signaling with Distinction. Sumit Sarin, Genetics and Development. Tatsen David Sung, Biomedical Informatics. Sarah Colleen Steenrod, Neurobiology and Behavior. Xin Xin Katie Zhu, Biomedical Informatics. Congratulations to all of our PhD recipients. It's actually a very special treat for us to be able to have this combined graduation ceremony for both the MD students and also for the PhD students who've done their PhDs with our faculties in the medical school. And now where I thought I was before, but I had a slight brain cramp, uh, Dr. Lisa Melman, our Senior Associate Dean for Student Affairs. It's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you. This is a class of inspired and giving students who truly make a difference. They started a new clinic for the homeless. They added a mental health arm to another student-run free clinic. They initiated a fir the first of an annual multicultural show. They fundraised for victims of the Haiti earthquake, and they awed us over and over with their musical, dance, and athletic talent. Many conducted research, some got a second degree. They looked out for one another and partnered with faculty and administration to make our school and community a better place. We send you, the class of 2010, your families and your significant others, a hearty congratulations. Let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit more about the class. With 166 graduates, this is the biggest class in the history of PNS. We have 46% women, making 54% men. In terms of dual degrees, 13 are MD-PhDs, 5 MD-MPH, Master of Public Health, 10 MD-MBA, Master of Business Administration, to MD DDS, and an additional 31 did an extra year of research, resulting in 37% who took extra time for research or a dual degree. 24% matched at Columbia for part or all of their postgraduate training. 44% will remain in New York State for training, mostly in New York City. This is a class that came to know one another well. In fact, 12 couples matched from this class, eight in which both parties are in the class, and four shared with other schools. Six babies were born during medical school, and another is due any moment. As Dean Goldman says, medical school indeed is a marathon, and, in fact, 19 marathons, actual marathons, were run by members of this class. 
Graduates, in the envelope that you received today, in addition to your diploma, you will find a copy of your MSPE, your Dean's Letter. Please rise when I call your row, when your row will be called, and proceed to the ramp to my left. When your name is called, come up to receive your diploma from Dr. Goldman, and then walk down the ramp on my right and return to your seat. Katayun S. Adami. Mohsen S. Ahmed. Sunil P. Amin. Eric J. Arias. James J. Atra. Lamont J. Barlow. Allison Barnes Callahan. Priya Batra. Jason A. Beatty. Shanicia N. Beecher. Sheila V. Bellardo. Daniel M. Burke. Maurer Biscotti III. James Bordley V. <laughs> Alexandra J. Borst. Michael K. Bowden. Christopher A.B. Boyle. Laura N. Brenner. Marcel Bruce Raymer. Adam M. Buck. Daniel W. Burke. <laughs> Kelly L. Burke. <laughs> Louisa S. Canham. <laughs> Matthew B. Cantlin. Ryan T. Cassley. Peter N. Chalmers. Isaac Chan. May King Chan. Aileen Y. Chang. Maggie J. Chow. David Y. Chung.
Babakar Sise. David T. Coyle. Elizabeth A. Dale. Megan E. Daly. Ephraim Y.S. Dickinson. Anthony S. Ding. Elizabeth J. Diver. Catherine E. Dodds. Nicholas M. Donnan. Peter S. Downey. Peter F. Duggan. Mark D. Durska. Barbara L. Edwards. Aton E. Eiches. <laughs> Gary S. Escola. <laughs> Kelly N. Falfreden. Erica D. Ferrand. Gladys Felix. Darius C. Fulis. Michael L. Fingerhead. Laura E. Fisher. Jean M. Franzone. Ronald W. Galbraith. Mina S. George. Alexandra M. Grigno. <laughs> Elliot I. Grodstein. <laughs> Jennifer L. Halleck. <laughs> Magni Hamso. Benjamin G. Hasid. Jonathan A. Hatoon. Brandon S. Hayes. Melanie N. Hood. Yeah. 
Jason A. Hove. <laughs> Kathy K. Huang. <laughs> Emily E. Herstack. <laughs> Jeremy C. Huang. Lindsay M. Innes. Ryan M. J. Ivey. Wang Ji. John M. Kazmar. Emily C. Cotter. <laughs> Jennifer L. Caston. <laughs> Jacob L. Kaufman. <laughs> James T. Kearns. David T. Kent. Nora Khatib. Abraham D. Kim. Rosemary Koo. Alexandra LaJoy. Lacey Ann P. Landell. Brian A. Landsman. Crystal J. Larson. Jenna and Lee. Anju Lee. Leslie K. Lee. Adam W. Leisher. Estine H. Lenyon IV. <laughs> Lorraine Lopez. <laughs> Sean X. Luo. <laughs> Michael R. Ma. Christy J. Mashita. Christina L. Mallets. Hanny R. Malone. Robert A. McGovern III. Alexander S. McLawhorn. <laughs> Kathleen A. McManus. <laughs> Daniel C. Medina. <laughs> Z. 
Zoe A. Miller. Linnea M. Mills. Kelly L. Milton. Daniel K. Moon. Aaron C. Murphy. Martha R. Nayagu. Emily L. New. Carmel T. Norris. Christopher A. O'Neill. Christopher O. Ortiz. Kristen A. Pastor. Kinjal Patel. Ravi Pathak. Hector R. Perez. Pilton A. Finnessy. Mark Philip T. Pimentel. Sarah K. Platt. Jason E. Prasso. Alvin R. Rajkumar. Courtney E. Raker. Christopher Ramos. Yelena Reckman. Sean N. Reynolds. Timothy R. Rice. Sarah Richards Kim. Darone Ringler. Marie Roguski. Jesus Rubio. John C. Ryan. Renee C. Sanger. Tristan T.J. Sands. Vincent M. Santillo. <laughs> Nina A. Saxena. <laughs> v. 
Vikram V. Saxena. Trevor P. Scott. Catherine M. Seeger. Jose M. Silva. Catherine Simon. Caitlin R. Smithling. Masa A. Sorab. Jessica J. Son. Moen Son. Robert A. Sorabella. Matthew E. Spotnitz. <laughs> Megan B. Spires. <laughs> Michael T. Stark. Daniel H. Stevens. Mary L. Stevenson. Melissa Sum. Preeti J. Thaiparumpal. Danielle F. Treef. Eugene Tsai. Benjamin C. Tweel. <laughs> Emily A. Vale. <laughs> Matthew B. Wallenstein. Lily C. Wong. Matthew J. Weinstock. Sophie B. Wells. Gregory D. Weston. <laughs> Solomon L. Waldo. <laughs> Jillian F. Wolf. Zachary G. Wright. Kyle L. Wu.
Sean May H. Wu. Caroline A. Yao. Jason Y. Yi. And Vijay Yarabundi. Graduates, please rise for the Hippocratic Oath found in your program. In our profession, it is a custom established more than 2,000 years ago that no one may be admitted to its honors who has not first expressly undertaken its obligations. Now, therefore, I call upon you to take as we have taken before you the oath which bears the name of Hippocrates. The language in which our predecessors first pronounced it is no longer spoken. The very gods whom they called to witness have been discarded. But still we can find no nobler words than the most ancient in which to hand down the traditions of our calling. Please join with me. I do solemnly swear by whatsoever each of us holds most sacred, that I will be loyal to the profession of medicine and just and generous to its members, that I will lead my life and practice my art in uprightness and honor, that into whatsoever house I shall enter, it shall be for the good of the sick to the utmost of my power, my holding myself far aloof from wrong, from corruption, from the tempting of others to vice, that I will exercise my art solely for the cure of my patients and will give no drug, perform no operation for a criminal purpose, even if solicited, far less suggested, that whatsoever I shall see or hear of the lives of my patients, which is not fitting to be spoken, I will keep inviolably secret. These things do I swear, let each of us bow the head in sign of acquiescence. And now, if I will be true to this my oath, may good repute ever be mine, the opposite if I shall prove myself forsworn. Please remain standing for the benediction. We give thanks for each of you Care for us, care for us all, Godspeed. This is both a graduation and as we always call it a commencement. It's a graduation because today's doctors whether they be PhD or MD, have completed an extraordinarily vigorous set of requirements. You have proven in the classroom, in the laboratory, in the clinics, and in the wards how special you are. Now that this phase is over, we can think about commencement. This begins your careers as scientists, as physicians, as healers. We hope we've trained you well 
We know from all the people who have joined you here today that in many ways you are well trained even before you arrived here. We wish you more than just not screwing it up. Well, that's a good start. We wish you the best in your careers as you go to cure disease, to make humanity better. There's no more noble calling, no more noble profession. We know that as have many generations before you, you're up to the task. You'll all make the world better. Thank you, everyone.